Today, the subject will be uh, Metronic Dual Chamber Pacemaker in a patient with atrioventricular block. So for those who are not there on the two previous sessions, the first one was the basics of the interrogation of a Metronic device. And the second one was about uh, how to program a pacemaker in a patient with sinus node dysfunction. So today, and we'll start in one minute, and the AV block, patient with complete AV block. So if you sum patient with sinus node dysfunction and patient with AV block, you are nearly 100% for the patients who are implanted. Okay. So, uh, what you see here on the screen is uh, the nominal values of uh, the nominal programming of a, a dual chamber metronic pacemaker. And we're going to discuss how to program a patient with a dual chamber metronic device when is implanted for a complete atrioventricular block. So the same that for uh, sinus node dysfunction, the, the very important parameters that you need to program first is of course the mode. And as explained before, uh, you can see that nominally, uh, the device is programmed AAI DDD. So uh, this mode has been specifically uh, developed uh, to decrease the amount of right ventricular pacing. And of course, it is not the appropriate mode uh, in a patient with complete AV block. What is sure is that it's not a problem huh? in a patient with AV block is programmed this way. Uh, after a certain time, every 16 hours, you may find something like a drop uh, P wave if the patient is in complete AV block. And most of the time, this is not symptomatic. So that's not a big deal. Huh? Of course, if you do not modify initially the programming, that's not a problem, but there's no reason uh, to program this mode. So what we will do first is to program the mode as DDD. You can do it, please. So here, the point will be uh, most of the time, you will want to uh, track the actual sensing the actual spontaneous activity. And after the sense AV delay, you will pace the ventricle. Okay, so first question is about rate adaptive pacing. Uh, of course, that's not low, but allow, but in many patients, the majority of patients with AV block do not have problem of the chronotrop chronotropic and competency. So I will not systematically program the rate adaptive pacing in this patient, only if for one reason I see during exercise that there is a problem of uh, rate adaptation of the heart rate. So initially, D, D, D. Uh, I will now share my screen. So, Sorry for this, it's one more time in French, but I'm sure you will understand. This is a patient implanted for complete AV block. And as you see here, the nominal programming has not been modified, so AAI DDD. And this is what you encounter after three months of implantation. You can see here uh, the curves and the frequencies here, this is the atrium. In white, means, it means it's sense. And here, this is the ventricle. And in black, it means that it is space. So this is exactly what you expect in this patient with complete AV block. Uh, you see, you will be nearly 100% of the time atrial sensing and nearly 100% of the time ventricular pacing. And you see the acceleration of the rate of the spontaneous activation uh, during probably exercise. And that's the, the curve you are you want to have in this kind of patient. So you see most of the time is in rates, uh, daily life rate, I would say between 60 to 80 bits per minute. And sometimes during exercise, there is more acceleration. So clearly in this patient, there's absolutely no reason to program the rate adaptive function. And you see here the response in, in terms of ventricle. For sure, if I see this patient, at my consultation, I will, I will modify the programming from AI DDD to DDD. So 
in when the patient is in sinus rhythm with complete AV block, there's absolutely no reason to program the rate adaptive function in most of these patients. Uh, someone, so this is another patient also implanted for complete AV block. And you see here, this is a patient uh, after a certain time, demonstrate permanent atrial fibrillation. You see here, the curve at the level of the, the atrium here, white is sense. So you see permanent, very fast atrial rhythm corresponding to atrial fibrillation. But now if you look at the ventricular rate, once more, this patient is in complete AV block. And you see here that in black is paced 100% of the time, but there is a rate adaptive function. But if you look at the programming, it is programming DDD. Someone, does someone know why if this patient is programmed with a mode DDD, how can it be that there is an acceleration of ventricular pacing here? Anyone? No. Uh, th this is something that you need to know. So in the chat, yes, of course. Uh, mode switch uh, as rate responsive on. Yes, in Metronic, I will show you. There, there's no possibility to program the, the mode during uh, mode switch. If there is a, a, a shift from DDD to the mode switch, it will be systematically DDIR. R. The rate adaptive function is always on when there is a switch function for that. Okay, so and that's why because incomplete AV block, if uh, there is a, a switch function and you you, you have a, a DDI without rate adaptive function in patient with complete AV block, you you will remain fixed at the minimal heart rate. So you need to have this possibility in these patients. So systematically, when you will program it, if you come back to the programmer, if you share the programmer, please. Up, you see that nominally, if it is DDD, the mode switch, I will systematically recommend to let it on. This is the capacity to switch from DDD to DDDI R in case of atrial fibrillation. If you click on, click on, you see that there is not many parameters that you can program. In some uh, devices, you can select the pacing mode if it is if there is a rate adaptive function or not. Here, that's not the case. In metronic okay. devices, dual chamber, systematically, it will be DDIR. Okay, so now if I share my screen. So now that this is a tracing here, just a few words about, uh, I will not go too much into details on how function the algorithm, uh, the switch algorithm from DDD to DDIR in, in case of atrial fibrillation. But the thing that you need to know is that in Medtronic, this is here a case of atrial fibrillation. So this is a patient with complete AV block. And then there is the onset here on this bit of an episode of atrial fibrillation. And when you see the line here, this is the time there is a mode switch from DDD to DDIR. The thing that you need to remember is in that in Mentrolic, it's very fast. There are different strategies according to the, uh, the different companies, uh, but in Biotronic and Medtronic, these two companies, the idea is really to switch very fast from DDD to DDIR. So after three bits here, you see, three ventricular bits, uh, there is a natural fibrillation counter, specific atrial fibrillation counter. I will not go too much into details, but it will count the number of atrial signals in between two ventricular signals. If there are at least two fast cycles in between two ventricular signals, then the counter, the atrial fibrillation counter will be implemented by one. So in these two, this one and this one, you see three atrial cycles. So the counter will be one two here because there are more than two here and then here also two cycles so the counter will be three and then it will switch automatically so after three ventricular bits with fast actual signals it will systematically switch to uh, ddir so remember this 
uh, this switch a lot, but of course this is an uh, this this will switch very fast. This is an advantage, but sometimes when you have a problem of over sensing or like this, you will also have more switch than in the other companies. So remember, Biotronic and Medtronic, the strategy is to switch very fast in case of suspicion of atrial fibrillation. When we'll see next week uh, about pacemakers, you will, you will see that the switch takes much more time sometimes for a switch uh, before uh, recognizing the atrial fibrillation and switching, and switching from DDD to DDIR. Okay. Now we'll have a look to this tracing and we're going to spend quite a long time to discuss about this. So here, that's a biventricular pacing, but that's the same for a traditional pacemaker. The difficulty for a dual chamber pacemaker is to manage correctly these sequences of atrial sensing and ventricular pacing with quite fast atrial reason. Because the difficulty for the pacemaker will be to say, okay, this can be a real sinus tachycardia. This is exercise sinus tachycardia, and I want to track the ventricular pacing on atrial sensing. But that can also be a pacemaker mediated tachycardia. I don't want to track uh, a ventricular, fast ventricular pacing in case of pacemaker mediated tachycardia. And the, the third option can be also, that can be what we call a blunt flutter. One of two atrial, uh, atrial flutter signals are blanked here just after ventricular pacing. So there are three options for the pacemaker. It can be a sinus tachycardia, and I want to follow it. I want to track the atrial sensing. This can be a PMT. I don't want to track. And that can be also uh, um, a blanked atrial flutter, and I, I don't want to track. Okay, so the difficulty here and the programming with you, you will have to think about all the three possibilities. So now if you show me the screen, share the programmer, yes. Okay, so this is a simulator and this is the nominal programming. As I say, programming DDD, mode switch on, lower track 60 bits per minute, and then the upper track here is programmed 130 bits per minute. And what we're gonna simulate is a sinus tachycardia. So you can simulate the sinus tachycardia, please. So acceleration of the atrial rhythm. You see here, acceleration, acceleration, acceleration. And then at one time, the atrial rate will be faster. That's the case here already. Okay, stop. Freeze this. I'm sorry, I don't see it, yes. So that's a two to one here. No. Now you, you need to simulate a sinus tachycardia with just the acceleration. Can you do this, please? Okay, uh, I will take back the screen. Oh, we had a little problem here. No, that's okay, that's okay now. No, 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 it's sure. Okay, do it again. All right, let's go back. Share the screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so that's the same as the 31, 2, 3. Four. Okay. Yes. All right. Now we can freeze. You can freeze. So, what do we see here? You see that initially you are on one on one one-to-one -one, atrial sensing, ventricular pacing. But if the sinus rhythm is faster than the upper track, if you program, for example, like in nominal 130, if the atrial rhythm is faster, the sinus rhythm is faster than 130, there is no possibility that you remain one-on-one -on -one because this is a limit for uh, the, the, the device. It cannot pace faster than 130 beats per minute. So what happens? If the, like this, the actual rhythm is now, is now 135, so faster than the upper track, you see that to maintain the one-on-one -on -one relation between actual sensing and ventricular pacing first, you need to prolong the AV delay. So automatically, you will, you will see a prolongation of the AV delay. 
And then at one time, if you, prog- if you prolong the LV delay, you decrease the duration of the ventricular artery, uh, atrial signal, uh, atrial delay. So if you program the, a- the AV interval, you decrease the VA interval. And at one time, the atrial signal will fall inside the PVAR. You see here the P, and then you will have a blocked P wave. So if you if you show the whole tracing at the end, every X bits you will have one. Uh, you see here, for example, systematically you see every six bits you have one blocked P wave because this P wave is a f- falls inside the P bar. Okay, so for this, if you want to correct this, the only solution. This is called the uh, Venkebach behavior, like for a uh, Venkebach block, that's a Venkebach behavior with a pacemaker. You see like this, every six bits, for example, you will have a block P wave. Most of the time, this is not symptomatic. Most of the time, the patient is not too much symptomatic, at least on this kind of drop P waves. If there is one every six or seven bits, most of the time, the patient is poorly symptomatic. It can be. And sometimes we have seen some arrhythmia also generated because of the block P wave during exercise. So here, the only solution will be uh, to uh, reprogram the upper track rate to a faster one. There is absolutely no reason to limit this upper tracking rate. If you know that the patient has a sinus tachycardia, and if, for example, he's young and he will reach a, a rate of 160 bits per minute, there is absolutely no reason to limit this upper track and you need to reprogram the device to allow for a one-to-one relation between atria and ventricle up to very fast rhythm, if it is uh, the case in this patient. Now, I will show you the second problem that you can encounter if you can simulate now the two to one. This is another problem that you can encounter in patients uh, with complete AV block. Remember, once more, the Venkerbach behavior and the two, one, the two to one point block will only be observed in patients with complete AV block, not in patients with sinus node dysfunction, two different kinds of problems. So now you see, so if you come back to one to one, and I will show you how you can, it's easy uh, to program something. Yes, so you one to one, and then, okay. And then what you will do now is to prolong the AV delay. If you click on Sense AV, okay, click on Sense AV, and program, let's see, something like 300 milliseconds. Okay, program. You see, if you freeze, now what you see on the tracing, now show me, yes, at one time. When you have prolonged the AV delay, every uh, every other bit will, uh, will fall inside the P-VARP. So you will have a, a sense ventricular pacing, and then the next bit will be AR because in the P-VARP, and then a sense ventricular pacing, and every other bit will be blocked. So that's what is called the two to one block. And remember, when back behavior, maximal tracking rate, this is the, the solution. Two to one block, the two parameters that you need uh, to reprogram or to modify are the AV delay, the sense AV delay, it's ASVP, so it's not paste AV delay, but sense AV delay, and the PVR. So if you close this, you will see that uh, here, that's the question of these two parameters, the sense AV delay and the PVR. We're going to rediscuss how we're going to program it uh, just after. I will show you some other tracing first. So that's another patient. So as I explained, for the device managing the question of fast AS and then ventricular pacing is difficult because that can be what we have shown. So a problem of Venkerbach behavior, that can be a two-to-one block, but 
that can be also this kind of problem. This is a patient that has been implanted and comes back three days after implantation because of heart failure. And when we receive the patient, you see that this patient is, you know, it's paced very fast with something like fast atrial signals and ventricular pacing. What is surprising here is that you see that the AV delay is longer than what it should be expected for this rate. And you see this is permanent, fast atrial sensing and ventricular pacing. So once more, three possibilities here. It can be a real sinus tachycardia. It can be also atrial tachycardia, but it can be PMT and it can be the blank flutter. And the fact that the AV delay is prolonged here, we think that that could be a PMT. And what I show here is that in this patient program, programming here, we have programmed the, the algorithm of, for the PMT in Medtronic devices. And you see that after eight bits, this signal will fall inside the PVAR. This, that, this is a, um, an algorithm that had, be, that had been designed to recognize the PMT and to interrupt the PMT. Uh, it has been modified in the very new versions of the pacemakers, but here that's an old one. It was very simple. After eight fast cycles, actual sensing, ventricular pacing, there was a suspicion of PMT, and there is a, there was a systematic prolongation of the the PVARP. Then the signals falls, the actual signals falls inside the PVARP. So it's 400 milliseconds here, and then it will stop systematically the PMT. Okay, so that was clearly a PMT. And remember that in the nominal programming of the Metronic devices, the PMT interruption algorithm is off. So in this patient. This algorithm was not, the programming was not modified, so it was nominal. The PMT intervention was off, and this patient came back for heart failure uh, because of fast uh, ventricular pacing for three days. And we have programmed the algorithm, and it will enter here the PMT. Another tracing, and just the same once more fast at your sensing and then ventricular pacing. This is a patient with AV block. And if you look at the actual EGM here, you see that you see the signal here, but there is a doubt. Maybe there, there is also another signal. One here, one there, one here, one there. The question is, is this a sinus tachycardia or are there two signals in fact? And one which is blanked, so you cannot see because it is in the actual blanking following ventricular pacing. And this is an old uh, Medtronic device. It has been modified now in the new pacemakers. But at this time, in this pacemaker, you could program one algorithm with uh, which was called, I think, uh, atrial blanked searching, atrial at atrial blank atrial flutter searching. I think it was the, the name. But you see, so the same patient with fast actual signals, ventral pacing, you were programming this algorithm and just the same that's for uh, the PMT, after eight bits, there is one prolongation. This is the, exactly the same algorithm. There is a prolongation of the PIVA. So, and you see that this signal here that was labeled AS now becomes AR. So there is no ventricular pacing since it is AR. And you can see that at the time where there should be the ventricular pacing, it is AR, so no ventricular pacing. And then the, the, the device recognized that there is a natural signal, meaning that here there was a natural signal that was blank and that you could not see because of ventricular pacing. So the device recognized the flutter, the blank flutter and mod switch will switch to the DIR, okay? So there was this algorithm at this time to recognize the blank flutter, you see? So the difficulty for the device is to differentiate what is sinus tachycardia, PMT, and blank flutter in case of fast actual signals and then ventricular pacing, okay? I show you this because 
what I have shown is a problem of blanked atrial flutter. In the new devices, Medtronic, you need to know this, this, this feature. You need to recognize these markers, these signals, because this is quite frequent. This is a case here of a patient with atrial pacing and ventral pacing. But what is surprising here is that after every ventral pacing, there is here a signal, small signals that is sensed by the atrial channel. And what you see here is that the, the device C oversends systematically the ventricular signal. So the atrial channel oversends the ventricular signal. So it is a far field R wave oversensing, and this is quite systematic. But what is surprising and which is what is very specific to metronic devices is that the marker is AB, so atrial blanking. So these signals falls inside the atrial blanking. What you need to know is that the risk of that is that you will you may arrive to inappropriate diagnosis of atrial fibrillation if there is atrial oversensing one of the problem is that you could switch to ddir for a false diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and when you will have a look to the memories also you may find episode of atrial fibrillation which are not in case real atrial fibrillation but are problem of oversensing so this is something you need to correct and what you need to know is that for the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, as I explained before, there is a counter of atrial fibrillation. And the signals that are labeled AB will be integrated in this counter. What it means is that if there is a signal which is labeled AB, you may have false diagnosis of atrial fibrillation and for false switch uh, from DDD to DDIR. Okay? So, if you see this, you need to correct this because if, for example, there is an acceleration, acceleration of the actual rate, if this becomes to be AS, then there could be a false diagnosis of actual fibrillation. So this is something that you need to correct okay, systematically. And you see here, and I will show you just after how you can program it. But you see here that I have changed something and I'd make it disappear. What is also, you see, you do not see now over sensing. And uh, what is very specific on Metronic device is that you can reprogram uh, the method on how will work this PVAB. So the blanking following a ventricular pacing. That's something that you can modify. And I will, I will show you how you can do it, okay? Pierre, can I ask a question? So we yes. see those AB markers, and yes. you say that they have an in, they influence the uh, atrial fibrillation counter. Yeah. Do they also influence the 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 rate during which the pacemaker is working or not? No, 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 no. A, a signal uh, that falls or inside the blanking or in the pivot will not modify the rate. Okay. No, here you are out of this will not be integrated in the rate. We can see that. We, uh, we not, see that the rate we, is the same after the programming yeah. and before. A signal AB will not inhibit actual pacing, if that's the question. Okay. Okay. So if you come back to the screen, now, so the programmer. Okay. So now we're going to discuss about, okay on how to program it. So as I explained, first the mode, DDD. The mode switch always on. The lower rate, 60 bits per minute. The upper track will depend, of course, on the patient. But remember, if the patient has episode of uh, quite fast sinus tachycardia, there is no reason not to program one uh, upper track uh, faster than the capacity of the patients. Even if the patient uh, suffers from coronary or this kind of thing, it's not physiological at all because if you program it to when the patient will demonstrate sinus tachycardia, then you will have Wenkevac behavior and that's not physiological at all. Okay, so now we're going to discuss about how to uh, avoid the problem of the two to one block. The first thing that you can reprogram is the sense AV. If you click on sense AV, once more, 
if you discuss about two to one block, it's a question of sense AV. Sense means actual sensing ventricular pacing. It's not a problem of paced AV, AP, VP. That's not the problem here. If you want to decrease uh, the risk of two to one block, and that's something that I reprogram systematically, you program a short sense AV. Nominally, it's 150. 150, you can program less, a bit less. For example, 130 particularly in patient in young patient but what you need to program is the active av so it's nominally off so that's something that i systematically reprogram in a patient with complete av block this parameter is off if you program it on you will have the possibility to decrease the duration of the saints av delay uh, when there is an acceleration of the actual signals. So if there is a sinus tachycardia, you will decrease and you can decrease it considerably. And when you do it, you remember the, the two to one point will depend on the sum of AV delay and PVARP. So the shorter the AV delay and particularly during exercise, so fast heart rate, the less the probability to encounter a problem to two to one block. So systematically, in a young patient, for example, I would program 130 milliseconds at rest, and then, for example, 90 milliseconds for the minimum sense IV for the fastest rate I will program, okay? So that's the step one, to decrease the risk of two to, two to one block, okay? Okay. The second parameters that you can modify is the PVARP. So PVARP, if you click on it, PVARP auto, that's a bit a strange ID, but the ID is to say, okay, I'm going to program, uh, the, the PVARP will change according to the heart rate. And the faster the rate, the shorter the PVARP, okay? The PVARP is supposed to be programmed as longer than the ventricular atrial interval. The point is to avoid uh, PMT. So you want a PVARP that is longer. So here, that's the, the dilemma. If you decrease the duration of the PVARP, you will decrease considerably the risk of two to one block. But if you decrease the duration of the PVARP, you increase the risk of uh, PMT if your uh, PVARP is shorter than the ventricular atrial interval of this patient. So that's where, okay, you need to see what is the problem in this patient. If the patient is very young, for example, in patient with, uh, let's say, congenital AV block, that's a difficult programming in this patient. When they are very young, you want to avoid the two to one point problems. And if they demonstrate congenital AV block, most of them do not have retrograde conduction. So in this patient, you can program very, very short PIVA because if you program short PVAP, you will not have problem of two to one blocks. And you know that if, if there is no retrograde conduction, there's no possibility of PMT. So that's easy in this case. The difficulty, for example, are young patients when you know there is a retrograde conduction. So patient is an AV block, but there is a retrograde conduction. So in this patient, you want to program it short, the PVAP to avoid two to one block. But if you program it too short, then you will increase the risk of PMT. So that's where there is a dilemma and a difficulty and you need to adapt according to the patient and the situation. Okay? But remember, Venker black block during exercise, question of upper tracking rate. Two to one block, question of AV delay and PVARP. The solution to decrease the risk of two to one block is to program the, the adaptive, the rate adaptive AV delay, sense AV delay, and if possible, to program uh, the auto PVARP to decrease it during, ec during exercise. But if you do this, there will be a risk of, uh, of PMT. Concerning the PMT, if you click on additional features, additional feature, once more, this is the nominal programming. PMT intervention is off, and I think you need to program it on systematically and that will be modified in the new uh, the new crt device but also the new pm in the next versions of dual chamber pacemaker and this uh, the pmt intervention will be nominally on but that's not the case today so systematically 
even if the patient is in complete AV block, except for example, for patients with congenital AV block. Most, the vast majority of patients with congenital AV block, they do not have a, a nodal node anymore at all. So there is no risk of PMT. So in this patient, you can program it very short and you don't need to program the PMT intervention, okay? For all the other one, even if the patient is in complete anterograde AV block, quite a high number of these also have re possibility of retrograde conduction. So I will systematically program the PMT intervention on. Okay. Now, if you click on blanking, on blanking, what we are discussing before was the PVAB. You see, you have the possibility to program the method. So if you click on it, click on it. You see, there are three possibilities. The first one is the absolute. Absolute blanking is like it has always been for blanking. It means that if a signal is inside the absolute blanking, then the signal will not be uh, seen. You will not see any marker and of course no interference with the atrial uh, fibrillation counter. So that's still a good possibility eh? in many patients. At the end, if you program an absolute blanking, you will avoid all the problems of a false diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, okay? But there are two other options. Nominally, it's, uh, click on it, it's partial. And that's what you have seen. You have seen that if a signal falls, a natural signal falls inside this blanking, of course, after ventricular pacing, there are 30 milliseconds. The details are not important, but after ventricular pacing, at the level of the atrial channel, there are 30 milliseconds of complete absolute blanking. No possibility of sensing at all. Remember, when you pace, you pace in volt. When you sense, you sense in millivolts. So it's one to 1,000 uh, ratio. So if you do not protect the actual channel when you pace the ventricle, for sure you will, you will oversense the signal. So even if you program with partial, like this, 150 milliseconds, it means that after ventricular pacing, at the level of the actual channel, you will have 30 milliseconds of absolute blanking. And then from 30 to 150 milliseconds, if a signal is falls inside this window, 30 to 150, it will be seen and you will see a, 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 a signal labeled AB and this signal will count for uh, the atrial fibrillation diagnosis. So you need to solve this problem in this, because if you don't, you may have a lot of false episodes of atrial fibrillation. There is a third option. If you click on it, partial, you have the possibility to program partial plus. And that's something that personally I do systematically in all the patient, what, whatever the indication. I Nominally it's partial and systematically I will program partial plus. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about the same. It means that when you pace the ventricle at the atrial channel, you have 30 milliseconds of absolute blanking. And then from 30 to 150, is a signal falls in this window, it will also be recognized. It will count for uh, the atrial fibrillation counter, but the difference between partial and partial plus, plus mean less. It means that if you program partial plus during this window between 30 milliseconds and 150 milliseconds, the device will become much less sensitive than it should be. You see? It will be, if you program partial, the sensitivity is not modified. It works the, the way it should be. If you program partial plus, you will try to sense, but being much less sensitive than what you have programmed. That's clear. For this window, the, the, the device uh, try to sense something, but being much less sensitive. So the, you decrease considerably the risk of false diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, you decrease considerably the risk of atrial sensing because the device becomes much less sensitive in this window. Okay? Are there any questions? Okay? So this is something that I do systematically. Okay? Program the rate adaptive uh, AV delay. Usually I let the PVAR auto and Additional features, I program the PMT intervention on, and on the blanking, I program partial plus more than partial. Okay, so now I will show you 
other anyone has an idea on this what is the problem here so that's a dual channel pacemaker in a patient with av block what is the problem here so that's normal make uh, the way it should work atrial sensing ventricular pacing atrial sensing ventricular pacing and you see here there is atrial under sensing uh, under sensing so you will have ap vp and I, i'll try to show you what can be the problem that you may encounter in patient with a dual chamber pacemaker and av block the same here a patient it's by v but it could be uh, the same with ventricular pacing but asv by v asbv you see here the atrial channel this is not unusual that during exercise and sinus tachycardia there is a lot of change in the amplitude of the atrial signals a lot of modification with breathing you see the breathing cycles here decrease during uh, increase and decrease you see in the amplitude but from at this time the patient does not feel anything since there is a correct atrial sensing but the next step of exercise you see that here there is now atrial under sensing and there is a sudden drop on the rate of the ventricular rate a patient with av block during exercise you have fast ventricular pacing because there is a fast diagnosis of sinus tachycardia if at one time there is under sensing at the level of the atrium you will have a systematic drop in the, the rate of the ventricle and this can be very symptomatic you see here this is under sense in the sense in the sense you will have actual pacing at the time you should not have actual pacing there is a risk also of induction of actual fibrillation so that's a problem here of atrial under sensing and you see now uh, the problem of two to one block during exercise have been solved because now you will see some alarms, alerts, be careful if you program this, you will have a too low two to one block. So it is quite infrequent now, except for very young patients with congenital AV block, for example. This problem here of actual uh, uh, under sensing, I think is more frequent. And if the patient say, okay, I'm a patient with AV block and during exercise at one time, I, I feel something, I think I'm going to, I'm going to fall or something and I, I may have syncope or one of the possibility is actual under sensing that's that's not so infrequent so this is something you need to think about when you program for example the sensitivity at the level of the atrium you need to program a margin even if you detect and sense correctly at rest remember that during exercise you may have a change in the amplitude of the signal, very small signals here, and then you may have uh, actual under sensing. And so you need to program a margin uh, when you program the actual sensing. Another thing is these patients with uh, complete AV block. You see ASVP, ASVP, and at one time you see here clearly at the level of ventricle signals, you see the noise but if there is a noise and a false diagnosis this is a false di diagnosis of ventricular tachycardia this is not a real ventricular tachycardia what the problem here is a problem of oversensing because of problem at the level of the leads uh, that can be a reason for syncope huh? in patient with av block you need to correctly program uh, the ventricular sensitivity uh, because of the problem of the sensing and of course uh, be careful you need to be uh, if there is a problem of ventricular lead that can be a huge problem because not only of loss of ventricular uh, capture but also because of this problem of ventricular over sensing so we're going to discuss also uh, about how to program the sensitivity and the last tracing i show you here is a patient that was symptomatic before being implanted with uh, AV block before, and you see here, he comes back be because it, it, it is now again, he, he now again feels any symptoms like lipothymia or this kind of syncope, near syncope. And you see that you have a loss of ventricular capture here, loss of ventricular, systematic loss of ventricular capture. So this is the spontaneous signals, but you see now the patient is very slow. So if you come back to the, the screen, so you, you share your, your screen, please. You need to remember 
so first of the if you click on amplitude at the level of the right ventricle please amplitude you see uh, to avoid the problem of loss of capture today there is a possibility you can program the capture management click on it three possibility it can be off if you program it off there will no, no be any kind of measurement, automatic measurement of the thresholds, no measurement of the threshold, and of course, no adaptation of the amplitude. You can program it monitor. If you program it monitor, it means that the device will systematically measure the ventricular and atrial threshold every night at 1 a.m., and you will see the curves and you will see the results, but without adaptation. And you can program it adaptive. Adaptive means that it will also measure the threshold every night at 1 a.m., but then it will adapt the amplitude of pacing. And that's something which is very, very important. You need to know the specificities on how it works for every company. Uh, every, uh, you know, between, if you compare Medtronic devices and Abbott, this is different, for example, clearly different. The way you measure the threshold is more or less the same in all five companies at the level of the ventricle. But the way you will adapt then the amplitude is really different. And you need to know if it is auto threshold or let's say something like auto capture. And for Medtronic at the level of the atrium, but also at the level of the ventricle, this is an auto threshold. It means that you measure the threshold, but then you will not systematically verify on every bit, you will not do it, verify that the capture is efficient. You will measure the threshold once at 1 a.m. and then you will adapt the amplitude for the next 24 hours at the level of the atrium and of the ventricle without checking on the bit to bit that you are effectively uh, capturing. So for, for sure, in this patient with AV block, you need to know some, you need to know that. You need to know the maximal capacity of this algorithm. If you program it off, for example, program it off, please. And then click on amplitude. You see that you can you can pace up to eight volts with 1.5 milliseconds. Okay, so if you do not program the adaptation, you program you can program eight volt and 1.5 milliseconds. Close. If you close it, and now you program it adaptive, adaptive up. If you program it like that. You need to know that it will do the measurements, try to adapt the amplitude, but whatever happens, it cannot deliver more than five volts and one milliseconds. If you program it adaptive, there's no possibility that the device will deliver, for example, six. So if the patient has a high ventricular threshold, let's say a threshold at six volts, for example, you, you you don't you cannot program the adaptive because the maximum that you can deliver is five volts. So if it's six volts, of course you will not program it. But you need to know that. And but if the threshold is four volt, three point five, I think it's quite dangerous to program it like this because I would systematically program something like this: monitor to know the measurement of the threshold. But let's say I will program systematically six volt or seven volts, but not adaptive. Okay, the maximal capacity here is five volt and one milliseconds. And the other thing you need to understand is that since it is uh, a noto threshold without verification of the level of the capture, you need to program, of course, a, a more important margin than if it is an auto capture like in airbots. Okay, so the margin here at the level of the ventricle, the safety margin is two. You, so if you have a threshold of one, uh, two volts, for example, it will deliver four volts with a minimum adapt adapted amplitude of two volts. So you see that at the end, if you program it like that, there is not, it's not so advantageous because <laughs> you will not save a lot of battery, whatever the threshold. If the threshold is very low, let's say it's 0.5, if you program it like this, you will deliver two volts. If the threshold is 1.25, for example, you will deliver 2.5 volts. So at the end, if you program a monitor and a fixed value of 2.5 and 0.4 milliseconds, when the threshold are very 
are very good, less than one volt, you don't, it does not change a lot in terms of consumption. So do not expect too much of this kind of algorithm. You see the auto threshold, okay, I'm not a big fan of it. Okay, but you can program, it. at least program it, monitor, you will have the values of uh, the threshold that are automatically measured every day. Okay, okay, if you close it. And something which is very important, as I explained uh, last week, is that uh, uh, when you, what you want to avoid absolutely in a patient with complete AV block are the problems of ventricular oversensing. If the patient is in complete AV block, you want to pace it, you want to capture, and you don't want any kind of oversensing because if there is oversensing, then you will not pace the ventricle. So uh, the idea is what I want <laughs> is to avoid this. And that's quite difficult to program the level of sensitivity in a patient with AV block because when you will do the test, there's not going to be any R wave. So you cannot adapt your programming to the measurements of the R wave since there is no R wave, since the patient is in complete IV block. Okay. So in this patient, the idea is to say, I want to program the sensitivity, sensitivity, the ventricular sensitivity first to avoid any problem of oversensing. And second, what I want to sense, in fact, are the PVCs. Since there is no entrancing conduction, so you will not see ASVS, ASVS, since the patient is in complete IV block. What you want to see are potential PVCs. So the idea is to sense the PVCs without having problem of oversensing. And you need to remember, if you program the polarity as bipolar, it means that it's going to be an adaptive sensing, like in an ICD. If you program it as fixed, then it's uh, as unipolar, it's going to be a fixed sensitivity. But remember, so when you program polarity as bipolar, the nominal value in the, in the metronic device at the level of ventricle is 0.9 millivolt. Okay. Bipolar, close it. Close, please. Okay. The nominal value will be 0.9. So it works like an ICD, but it is less sensitive because you know that in a metronic ICD, the nominal value of the level of ventricle is 0.3. The method on how you will adapt the sens sensitivity along the cycle is the same in pacemaker in ICD, but you are less sensitive because the nominal value is less. But 0.9 is quite, uh, quite sensitive. Eh? So in some patients, no doubt that I will increase this value if I think that there is any risk of oversensing. Of course, I will differentiate the problem of oversensing, T-wave oversensing, for example, or oversensing of the P-wave or something like that, to problem of oversensing because there is a lead dysfunction. If there is a lead dysfunction, the solution is not to reprogram the, the level of sensitivity. The, the problem is to see the patient and then to change the lead. If there is a problem of lead dysfunction in a patient which is uh, dependent of the pacemaker, the point is not how will I program the sensitivity. I will, uh, the patient will come back and I will change the lead. That's the solution here. Okay, but remember, if you program it bipolar and 0.9 millivolt, millivolt, you may encounter some problems of oversensing. So do not hesitate, I think, to uh, um, increase uh, the, the number, so to decrease the level of sensitivity. Okay, uh, so if I summarize the mode DDD in a patient with AV block, remember that if you program the mode switch, the rate adaptive function is systematic in metronic devices. You, you can you can or cannot reprogram it. If it's there is a mode switch, it's going to be DDIR. The lower rate, 60 bits per minute, okay. The, uh, the upper track, you need to adapt the upper track according to the capacity of the patient. And once more, there is no, no reason to decrease this value if the patient can have sinus rhythm of 150, 160, I will allow the pacemaker to track the rate up to this value of 160 bits per minute. The AV interval, what is, if you click on it, the AV interval, important, what is important here is the sense AV, of course, since it's going to be ASVP. And remember that the rate adaptive AV is off nominally. So in a patient with AV block, I systematically program it on. Okay. On the amplitude, Click on it, okay. 
On the amplitude, you have the choice between adaptive and and uh, monitor. I think uh, remember adaptive. You cannot with this algorithm when this algorithm is programmed. You cannot deliver more than five volt and one millisecond. So be careful in patient with high threshold. Remember that this is a noto threshold. So you need to program high margin. And if you program high margin at the end, it will not save a lot of battery. Now, if you consider the sensing, remember if it's bipolar, it's going to be like an ICD. And be careful with 0.9 millivolt. You may be maybe in some patient too sensitive. For the PVARP, it's program auto, but uh, Sometimes, well, this is a balance between the risk between two to one block and PMT. For the blanking, I systematic, if you click on it, systematically reprogram partial to partial plus. It is partial on nominal and I reprogram partial plus, okay? Additional feature, I systematically program the P PMT intervention on. Okay, are there any questions?